Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Thank you. I would say Happy Hanukkah, but it starts this coming week, correct? Tuesday, I think, yeah. Is it Tuesday? Okay. So next week, we'll do Happy Hanukkah. Um, we are continuing our study on the fruits of the Spirit, or fruit exhibited in a life led by the Spirit, sealed by the Spirit, filled by the Spirit. So go ahead and open in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. Uh, we have been on this for several weeks. Those of you that know me know I don't like to rush things. I like to get there on time. We don't have to be early. Well, early is relative. Half an hour before it starts is, is on time for me. Um, don't laugh, Kim. <laughs> that's, that's very relaxed compared to how I grew up. I grew up an hour early, was late. So, um, we're working our way through, we're taking our time, we're looking at the fruit. We're seeing a number of things. I, I hope you're seeing some of the things that God has been showing to me. Uh, thus far, we've come across several key points. I want to just address those really quickly. But first, we're going to read the passage of Scripture. We're going to start Galatians chapter 5. I'm going to start in uh, verse... 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. <coughs> now the works of the flesh are evident. And I'm not going to go through this list. I just want to remind you, this is not an all-inclusive list. This is an example list. These are things that exhibit a life led by the flesh. Okay? Because you, you look at this list, and then you look at some of the other lists in the New Testament and go, well, that one wasn't included here, so that must not be a work of the flesh. Paul is not trying to write an all-inclusive list. Okay? Um, because scripture says that, that a sinner actually invents ways of committing sin. So you probably have sins that are unique just to you. Okay? So we have a list. And then he goes down. And he says in verse 22, we're going to pick up again. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, Faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Now, one of the things that we've picked up on is that whose fruit is this? It's, it's the Spirit. It's not ours. It's not something that we can just wake up one morning and say, hmm, today I'm going to exhibit goodness. Okay? Now you can try that, and I guarantee you God's going to make mockery of you because you, if you get down there and the coffee pot's going to be broken and all your goodness is gone. Okay? That's for those of you that coffee is goodness. For those of us that it's not, I'm okay with that. <laughs> there better be a cold Pepsi. <laughs> okay? So, this is something that is birthed out of God's Spirit living inside of you. Okay? It's His fruit. These are characteristics of His. Now, this is also not an all-inclusive list. This is an example list. These are the types of fruit that will grow out of your life. Uh, we talked a couple weeks ago about Thanksgiving. Now, I believe that is a fruit that should be exhibited in the life of every Christian. Why? Well, we have more to be thankful for. Don't we? I mean, count your blessings. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I gave you a list, a blank list, and said start writing in the things that you are thankful for. And if you have trouble with that, come talk to me. Because I can point out eight or ten of them for each and every one of you. Okay? We need to get our minds 
into what God has done. Because see, the opposite of thankfulness is grumbling. And, and if you're not really sure what that is, take a quick look through Scripture about what grumbling looks like and how God feels about that. Okay? God wants us to be thankful. So, thus far, we have looked at love, joy, and peace. And I got to tell you, I did not look forward to doing patience. <laughs> because every time we've gone through one of these, God has had me learn the lesson before I could teach the lesson. <laughs> and this week stunk. This week was hard. This week was horrible. Every slow driver was on the road this week. <laughs> Every one of them. And they were all right in front of me. And no kidding. I'm so excited. Ha ha, he's turning on Bell Crossing. And his evil twin brother pulled out right in front of me. <laughs> okay, God. I'm learning. I'm learning. So we're going to be looking at patience today. Now, one of the things that I found, I'm, I'm coming at this from a kind of a different angle than most of you are going to think about. Okay? Because we need to understand that the language that this was written in was not English. Okay? It was, none of this was written in English. Okay? God chose the languages that he knew best suited his purposes to write his word in. And he didn't choose English. There's a reason for that. Goose, geese, moose, meese. Okay? Point made? All right? English is, is a horrible, horrible language. We looked at that when we talked about love. I love my wife, I love my dog, I love my SpaghettiOs. But I don't love them all the same. Okay? So let's take a little look into patience. And you're going to have to be patient with me because I've got a lot of notes. So this is a test for you as well. The word that Paul chose. Now there are five or six words in the Greek that are used to... In English, we, we just translate them all patience. All right? The one that Paul uses here is, whoops, macrothumias. Okay, it's two words joined together. It's a compound word. Okay? And rendered in different places, long-suffering, forbearance, self-restraint before proceeding into action. But here's what struck me. This is something I had never seen before. And in looking back through this and, and studying this, after I read this, I went back and I re-examined the times that this word is used. This idea carries this image, okay? It is the quality of a person who is able to avenge himself, yet refrains from doing so. You get that? I'm going to read this to you again, okay? because this is important. The quality of a person who is able to avenge himself, yet refrains from doing so. For example, I could have jumped around evil twin and done 35 miles an hour down Eastside Highway. I could have done that. And probably previously in my life, years and years and years ago, maybe not quite that far, I would have. But God is teaching me something, and, and it's actually come through several of you here, and we will be talking after church. Okay? Vivian, Dave, just a quick meeting. God is teaching me to be patient, that he intentionally puts those people in front of me to slow me down. Okay? Um, don't, don't get me wrong. I don't speed. I do the speed limit. And if the speed limit is 60... I want to do 60. I don't want to do 
30. Okay? I don't even want to do 58. I want to do 60. My, that's my, the way my brain is wired. Okay? You have your own laughable things. Leave me alone. <laughs> okay? But God is teaching me, and actually through several people in this church, has told me that he is allowing this to cause me to slow down. Okay? So, when those happen, first I get frustrated and I get irritated, and, and Christy will kind of look at me out of the corner of her eye, and she immediately starts praying, and then God <laughs> speaks to me and I listen, and, and he says, you need to settle down. You need to, I'm doing this on purpose. But God, I'm going to be late. I'm only going to be 28 minutes early. <laughs> Just calm down. It's going to be okay. So, the idea carried here is that you have the ability to avenge yourself, to right the wrong that you feel is being done you. But you choose not to do this. Well, after having read that, I went back and I started looking in Scripture. And there were two examples that immediately just jumped out to me. Joseph. Genesis. Joseph is the favored child. My mom and dad had a favored child. It was not me. It was the other four. I do not have a favored child. Ask them. Do I, children? No. 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 Joseph was the favored child. Okay? He wasn't just favored by mom and dad. He was favored by God. Okay? And God spoke to him and gave him dreams and gave him revelation of dreams. And, you know, a lot, I used to think, David, wow, boy, he's stupid. Because if I had that many older brothers, I wouldn't be going to them and telling them things like, you guys are going to bow down to me. I wouldn't do it. Except I know from history I would have. <laughs> Guess what God said? Ha! And they probably would have beat me up and thrown me in a hole too. <laughs> okay. But, but his brothers, they get tired of him. They sell him into slavery. He goes off to Egypt. He works to Potiphar's house. He rises to second only to Potiphar. Potiphar's wife has the weird thing and David, or David, uh, Joseph goes to jail. I'll talk about going bad to worse. He rises in the jail so that the jailer trusts him to do things that the jailer should be doing. He excels in every position that he's, he's given. And the two men come to him and say, hey, we had dreams. Can you give us an interpretation? Yeah, good for you. You're going back to your job. Not so good for you. You're going to get killed. Have a good day. <laughs> and the, the one, the, the cupbearer, he gets restored to his job and forgets David. Or David. Why? What's with David? What's with David? Joseph. And he forgets Joseph. And time goes by. Joseph is still in jail. Then Pharaoh has a dream. Bing! Light bulb. The cupbearer has a light bulb moment. Oh, yeah. There's a dude over in jail that can interpret your dream. Well, bring him up! So they bring Joseph, he interprets Pharaoh's dream. He is immediately placed second over all of Egypt. Now, you want to talk about a position of authority? The only person who can gainsay you is Pharaoh? And David, 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 David. <laughs> <laughs> Evidently, I should have been looking at David. <laughs> David, yes. No. Joseph starts implementing some things that, that God has laid on his heart. God has made him an incredible administrator. He starts doing some things and, and building up for the seven lean years. And then they get to the lean time, and there's, there's plenty in Egypt. As a matter of fact, there's so much in Egypt that people from other countries are coming around. And guess who shows up? Not David. <laughs> No! <laughs> David's brothers. <laughs> Joseph's 
Joseph's brothers show up. Now, can you imagine? Think about this. Things are going well for you now, but look at the history. And here are the men that are directly responsible for that. Here they are. And it is within your power to do whatever you want to them. It's not only in your power, it's in your right. You can do whatever you want. See, that's why the story is about Joseph and not Glenn. Because I don't speak Egyptian. <laughs> I would not have been able to do, I don't think, what Joseph did. So he forgives. Now, we look at patients just going, oh yeah, I, I'll get through this. I'm, you know, it's rough now, but I'm going to get to the other side. But how often do we rail against whatever we're suffering? I, I told you the story about uh, Brother Yoon, um, the, the book, The Heavenly Man, and how the, the church in China just does not understand the church in America. They, they don't get us. Because they look at the suffering, the persecution, the trials that they're under as an opportunity. And Brother Yun got to come to the States, and he got to see the goings-on in the church in America. And one of the things that struck him was how often we pray for deliverance from trouble. And he told the pastor that brought him over, he said, please do not pray for our deliverance. Don't pray that the trials would stop, because that's what's keeping us strong. Pray that we would have the strength to endure. Okay? Pray that we would have the strength to endure. So patience. The ability to avenge yourself, but choosing to refrain from doing so. Now, the second example is not David. Who would you think of as the second example, or, or actually the primary example? of having the ability to avenge himself and yet refraining from doing so. Christ. Jesus Christ. If you look at the ministry, I mean, look at his birth. We're getting ready to celebrate his birth. One of the greatest pronouncements of his birth was the slaughter of every male child under the age of two in the village and surrounding area of Bethlehem. Wow, you think he had some opposition from the get-go? Wow. Philippians tells us that he is in his very nature God. Okay? God, completely sovereign. He gets to do whatever he wants to do and nobody can gainsay him because it's all his. My house, my rules. Right? So, if he should choose to do so, he could completely flood the earth, wipe everything out of existence, and start over again, right? Well, he already did that. And because he is faithful to who he is, it will never happen again because he said he would never do it again. <clears throat> But think about it. You know, the children of Israel, he delivers them from Egypt miraculously with power, with authority, with a demonstration of who he is, completely overwhelming all the Egyptian gods. Okay? He hit them right where they lived. He turned water into blood. He controlled all the pestilence. He darkened the sun. All of the gods of Egypt were powerless before him. And he delivers them. And then he brings them up to the Red Sea. And here comes Pharaoh and his army. No, we want you back. And God delivers them again with an incredible demonstration of his power. It seas part. Land is dry. Across they walk. Pharaoh's like, looks good to me. Let's go. And into the middle they go. No more Pharaoh or his army. Now that's power. Isn't it? Is that, is that not incredible? incredible? Then God brings him to the mount and he says, 
You stay here. I'm going to take Moses up and I'm going to give him my words. Great. Fantastic. All right. We're good. How long did he say we were supposed to wait? Well, he didn't. He just said wait. Are you sure he didn't say how long? Because, you know, we have stuff to do. I don't know what you got to do. You're out in the middle of nowhere. There's nowhere to do anything. There's nothing to do it with. Hey, Aaron. You know, we're talking weeks now. All right? Weeks. Forty days. Moses is up on the mountain. David was not here either. Okay? So the people come to Aaron. Aaron, we're out here in the middle of nowhere. The guy that brought us here is off celebrating with his God somewhere. We need something. Something. Well, here, give me your stuff. We'll throw it in the fire and we'll see what comes out. <laughs> this, this is the first high priest. Wow, if that doesn't speak to God's grace, I don't know what does. Okay. God had just done incredible things for them. Incredible, incredible things for them. And already they've turned away. I mean, look at that. The plagues, the deliverance. The, not only are they set free, but the Egyptians are giving them stuff to send them on their way. Here, take this. Go. You look at what they use to make the tabernacle. The amount of gold, the amount of silver, the amount of copper, the precious, the silks. All of the stuff that was used to put that together, that was all from the Egyptians. It's not like there was a market on the way for them to pick stuff up with. I'll trade you seven sheep for a bolt of silk. They, that was all. God had it planned. Wow, did he have it planned. Okay? So, back to Jesus. Heralding his arrival is the death of all the male children to another. Okay? This is a man born to a life of opposition. He starts his ministry. Immediately, people start going, I know this guy. I know I know this guy. Isn't that the carpenter's son? He's a, man, I saw him play on the playground when we were kids. He, man, he couldn't even, he couldn't even play leapfrog. <laughs> I mean, where's he getting the authority to say this kind of stuff? Who is he? Those are the people he grew up with. His family comes to him. And he's in teaching and ministering. And they're standing outside saying, Son, come on. Hey, you know, Jesus, I know we've had our differences, uh, you know, I remember the whole frog thing. That I know I was wrong, but dude, you got to come home. You're, you're setting yourself up. Just come home. Okay, now we're talking his family. Okay, it lists four brothers. It lists his mother. And it lists at least two sisters, because it's plural. That many people show up and tell you you're doing something wrong from your family? You think that's opposition? Well, then he gets to the people that should know better. I mean, his family should have known, shouldn't they? I mean, they grew up with him. This is a man who never sinned. How would you like that as a child? One of your children. Because you know if they do something that displeases you, they're not sinning. <laughs> Boy, that kind of puts you in the hot spot, doesn't it? So, the people he grew up with, his own family, have already come out in opposition to him. But that their opposition is actually fairly mild, because then we look at the religious leaders. Oh. Now, these are the people that should have known. Why? Because they were the ones entrusted with the very word of God that he was there to fulfill. What do they do? Get 
anything good come out of Nazareth? Anything? Come on, Nazareth. I mean, that's like North Dakota. <laughs> but we can't say that anymore, can we? Because there's all kinds of oil coming out of there. But I mean, they, they, they look with absolute disdain on this. And then they start hearing the things that he's saying. And they, hey, 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 hey. This is the Sabbath. We don't do things like heal people. Stop it. That's not God. That's the devil. I love the blind man. Because they call the blind man into question. Well, at first, they, they call the blind man's parents into question and they say, Tell us about your son. Why do you want to know? Well, you know, was he blind from birth? Yep. Well, what, what about this healing? <laughs> Ask him. He's of age. Don't drag us into it. Way to go, mom and pop. You just threw him under the bus. <laughs> Don't ask us. He's a big. Ask him. So they bring him in. What's going on? Don't you know this man is not of God? So I don't know whether he's of God or not, but someone that's not of God couldn't have done what was done to me. So I'm saying he's from God. Why are you asking all these questions? Do you want to follow him? <laughs> Honest question, right? Boy, that did not make him happy, did it? Oh, no. Get out. Get out. Look at the opposition. I mean, not just that they tried to stand up to him. And, uh, boy, talk about picking the wrong enemy. You're going to argue with someone that knows everything? <laughs> now, I'm not overly bright, but I know not to do that. And they start picking arguments about the law. So a man got married and died. Well, yeah, all of them that get married die. <laughs> well, and so does the wife. That's the way that things work for now. But, but she didn't, and she had, he had a brother, and he married her, and he died. And I'm starting to think, two or three brothers marry her and die? <laughs> <laughs> Don't eat her cooking. <laughs> eat out. Okay? Seven brothers marry her and die. <laughs> Live on the roof. <laughs> okay? I'm, I'm thinking, wow. Whose wife will she be in heaven? <clears throat> you guys don't even understand the scriptures. You, you don't get it. And heaven will be like the angels. There is neither marriage nor giving in marriage. Oh. oh. Uh, uh, Jesus, let us ask you a question. You know what? I'll answer your question if you answer mine. Did John come from God, or was he from man? Uh, well, um, give us a moment to confer. How would you answer this? I wouldn't. You're the one that asked him, so you're on your own. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> How would you answer this? Well, you know, I agree with him. Because you know, if we say it was from God, he's going to say, well, why didn't you listen? And that really doesn't make us look too good. But if we say it's from man, there's a lot of followers of John out there. There's a lot of people that believed him, and there's a lot of rocks around here. And I just have this aversion to rocks bouncing off my head. <laughs> so I think... You should answer, I don't know. <laughs> we'll go with that. You're fired. <laughs> we don't know. He says, well, uh, if you can't answer my question, I'm not going to answer yours. <laughs> okay? Now, I, now, not only is there opposition of this sort, but then they do this. You're hired again. Come here. <laughs> we got to get this dude out of the picture. Puddle up, puddle up, puddle up. What can we do? I know, I know, I know, I know exactly what we do. We got a little bit of money here. Let's hire some people to bring false accusation against him. Perfect. Perfect, perfect. That's what we're going to do. We're going to wait for an opportunity, and we'll falsely accuse him. We'll get him out of the way. Okay. So Jesus is arrested after facing persecution. They put him on trial. 
Now, I'm sorry, but that whole group had to be fired. Because they, they go out and they hire guys, and the guys couldn't agree on their stories. Oh, I saw him do this. What are you talking about? That's not what he did. He did this. Well, I was paid to say this. What were you paid for? <laughs> I did. We did. We just. He, he did bad things. And they weren't good. And he should die. We're never getting hired again. Okay? Opposition to the point that they persecuted him, they lied about him, they bring him up, and now, now check this out. The Jews don't even want to accept responsibility for killing him. So what do they do? They bring Pilate into the mix. They bring Pilate into the mix. Let's blame the Romans. Everybody hates them. Pilate, we have this man, and he's committed a crime and needs to die. Well, what crime has he committed? Well, he says he's king of the Jews. Are you king of the Jews? Yep. Well, I don't see a problem with this. <laughs> no, 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 no. He has to die. He's violated our law. So take him and punish him. Oh, no, no, no. We can't kill him. Only you can do that. Well, I don't see anything wrong with him. Well, Pilate, just so you know, we know that uh, Caesar is not happy with you. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here dealing with us. Uh, so, you know, if you let him go, you are not Caesar's friend, and we're going to let Caesar know that you let this man rise up to be king and to lead a rebellion against you. Hmm. I see your point. He's guilty. Let's, let's, let's get rid of this. Now, I'm making light of a lot of the things that happen. But you look at the life and ministry of Jesus and he faced opposition over and over and over and over and over again. Okay, even from the people that were supposedly on his side. Even from people that were supposedly on his side. You want to look at patience? Look at how he dealt with the disciples. How many times he said, what, do you, do you still not understand? I've been teaching you for three and a half years, guys. Do you still not get it? So, he's on trial. Actually, he's in the garden. Let's, let's back up to the garden. He's in the garden. I, I, I believe this was Peter. I, I just, I see this. They come to arrest Jesus. Peter wakes up. Dang it, I've been asleep again. And, I, and he wakes up, probably like some of you, he wakes up angry. We have people in our house that wake up angry. I don't talk to those people till later in the day because it's not pleasant. I'm either asleep or I'm awake. There's no in between. And so when I wake up, I'm about as good as I'm going to be throughout the day. That's all you're getting. So you may as well talk to me now and get it out of the way. Okay? But I think Peter woke up angry. And I think he woke up frustrated. I think he woke up scared. And man, he whips out a sword and thunk. <laughs> All right, and Jesus goes, what, what are you doing? Put away your sword and pick that up and give it to me. Boop. And he heals it. Okay? Now that right there is incredible. I mean, these men are here to arrest him, and he knows where he's going and what's going to happen. He's been in prayer, weeping, and shedding blood, sweating blood because of the anxiety and the stress that he's under. He's been begging God for another way, but accepting God's will regardless. And he heals the dude's ear. I'd have been like, that's what you get. <laughs> <laughs> but he heals again. But then he says something pretty interesting. This is out of Matthew 26. I'm just going to read it. You don't have to turn there. Matthew 26, 51 through 54 says, With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father, 
and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? Now think about that. 12 legions. A legion was approximately 6,000 people. Okay, so just with my rough math skills, it's about 72,000 angels. Boink, there. All he had to do is go, Father, boom, so there. Now, if that is not an apt description of the patience that we just described, that God exhibits and, and, and flourishes through us because of his spirit, I don't know what is. Jesus not only had the ability to avenge himself, he had the right. If anyone had the right, he had the right to avenge himself. And he says, no. Put your sword away. Now, I'm going to read you a Christmas scripture. This is one that we often associate with, um, actually we, we associate it more with um, Resurrection Sunday. Uh, turn with me, if you would, to Isaiah 53. I'm going to read this whole passage because it's all significant. But I'm going to point a particular thing out here. Isaiah 53, I'm going to start in verse 1. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. Okay, now think about this for a minute. He's describing God. Okay? He's describing the hypostatic union that is Jesus Christ, fully man, fully God. And he says, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him. Okay, keep, this, keep these passages in mind, because we're going to jump back to Philippians here in just a minute. And I want you to have this in mind when we read Philippians. There was no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. So which of us has not turned to our own way? No, we've all. Okay, so all of us are in this group. Okay? All we, like sheep, have gone astray, and we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death, and was numbered with the transgressors. 
yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Now, all of that describing what I just kind of went through with the, the ministry of Jesus, his arrest, his, his fallacy of a trial, his mockery of a trial, his death, burial, and ultimately his resurrection. Okay? But there's one passage in here that I want to show you specifically regarding patience. Okay? He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Now, think about this for just a minute. It is by his very word that everything in creation is held together. So by that same word, he could completely undo everything. And he's beaten, and he's scourged, he's abused. Scripture tells us that we would not be able to recognize him as a man, so grievous were the injuries done to him. Then he's led away, and he's crucified like a common criminal, even though he had done no wrong. And yet he chose to not utter that word. He chose not to defend himself. Instead, he entrusted himself to the one that judges justly. See, that's what patience is all about. Patience isn't your ability to withstand all the garbage that comes at you. It's not your ability to deal with that naggy, annoying co-worker that has bad breath. Or with that person in your life that just, you know, has the ability to set you on edge. Patience is having the ability to avenge yourself and choosing to refrain, refrain from doing it. Why? Because you're trusting yourself to the one who judges justly. You're trusting God in your life. See, that's what patience is all about. It's not about restraining yourself. Well, it kind of is. You know, um, we have Christmas presents under our tree. And yesterday, I had the opportunity to watch all four of my born grandchildren. And I say four that are born because there are two more that are unborn. <laughs> Just so you know, Christopher and Kayla are expecting as well. So Benjamin and Shay and Christopher and Kayla. But I had opportunity to watch for the children. Now there was about a 45 minute period where they had to learn, don't touch the Christmas tree. And, and I would get one off of this side. And don't touch that. Don't touch it. Okay, don't touch the tree, okay? Okay, don't touch it, okay? Okay. I turn around and there's a sibling on the other side. Oh, well, look at this. <laughs> well, don't touch that one. Touch the one that doesn't break. Now, why we were foolish enough to put breakable ones down low enough where they could reach, I don't know. <laughs> but I had the opportunity to spend the day with all four of my grandchildren. And it's Christmas time and, and Christmas, and we're moving toward presents. And there's an anticipation and excitement about opening presents. <laughs> They're excited too. It's not just me. <laughs> Patience is you have to wait until the due time, right? Yeah. Well, isn't that what God exhibited that at the right time he sent his son? Isn't that the patience he's exhibiting right now? Waiting until everyone that will be saved is saved before he comes back? and meets out justice? Isn't that patience? Wow. Isn't it patience when I make the same mistake over and 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 then because I'm stupid, over and 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 over again. And God goes, 
That, that's not what you're supposed to do. Right. Right. I'm not going to do this thing right here that I'm doing. I'm not going to do that anymore. You need to stop that. You need to do like this. Okay. 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 No. No. Okay. This is the patience that God is birthing in us. Now, here's the thing. We talked about this last week. This is God's fruit that is being birthed in us. But God expects us, God requires of us, God tests us in the growth and the maturity of that fruit. Do you, you understand that? <clears throat> when God wants to develop something in you, he expects you to do something. Okay? Now this is the cool part about it because you go... I am the most impatient person in the world. And he wants me to be patient? Yes. And he's going to keep giving you test after test after test to build that patience in you. Well, I'm going to fail every test. Every failure is a step closer to success. Every single failure is a step closer to success. Why? Because you're learning what you did wrong. Now, here's what's really cool about this. God will give you what you need to pass the test. It's, it's like, I, I don't know if you guys ever, only one time in my life was I allowed to take a test with a partner. Okay? Only one time. In school. God gives me all kinds of those in life with Christy. She's my partner and we get to take the tests together. And all too often we're like, don't cheat off of me. Do your own work. I don't want you dragging my grade down. You didn't study for this test. But that's, that's exactly what it's like, because see, when God gives us a test, he's right there with us to help us ace the test. And we're like, I got this. <laughs> Fail! <laughs> God says, okay, retest. God, help me to get through this, but be quiet while I'm going through it. But don't, don't we do that? I might be the only one. Maybe I'm the only one. But I know, and, and then, then I fail the test, and I look back and I go, oh, I should have listened. I should have listened. I should have asked you. Because I'll tell you what, Friday stunk. Friday was horrible. And Friday, God kept giving me opportunity after opportunity where I could choose to avenge myself or I could choose to refrain from doing so. And I did awesome until I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Laugh it up. <laughs> and then when I failed, and I knew I could feel myself. I could feel myself start going, I, just, I got this one. I'll, I'll take this one. I know I passed all the others with flying colors with your help but I think I got this one. And on my face, I spent the entire night miserable, failing, knowing what I needed to do and not wanting to do it because I, I don't want to admit he's right and I'm wrong. And so I had to get up Saturday morning and start all over again. Yesterday went much better. Part of that was because I was so exhausted by the time I went to bed, I couldn't face the test. I just fell asleep. <laughs> Thank God for that. God expects you to choose to walk by His Spirit. When you walk by His Spirit, He gives you everything you need to pass the test. Okay? And when He is working on fruit in your life, you'll know it. Because the last thing you'll want to do is be kind. The last thing you will feel is joy. And when he is working on you in your life to grow those fruits in you, to mature you, he is right there with you saying, come to me. I'm going to walk you through this thing. That doesn't mean it's easy, but boy, he makes it worth it. Boy, does he make it worth it. Amen? Amen. Patience. Being patient 
I, see, that's my introduction. <coughs> we're going to stop there for today because it's noon. So next week we're going to talk a little bit more about how that's played out in Scripture. We're going to see a little bit of some, of some things, um, see the different ways that patience is used in Scripture. Because like I said, this is only one Greek usage of this word. Okay? So, love, agape, completely dependent on what God has done for you, not based on what the other person can or cannot do for you. Okay? Joy. In the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy. Peace. A peace that the world cannot give. A peace that the world cannot understand. Patience. The ability to take vengeance for yourself, but refraining from doing so. Father, we bless you today. I thank you, Father, for this body of believers, Father, for this family. I ask, Lord God, that you would have our ears open to hear, our eyes open to see. Father, our hearts soft before you, prepared to receive what you would have of us. God, I am asking that you would settle your word in our hearts, that, Father, we would be encouraged, exhorted to move forward into those things that you are calling of us. Father, that we would live our lives led by your spirit, walking by your spirit. Father, not gratifying our flesh, but moving according to the dictates of your spirit. Father, that we would be a light shining brightly in this dark world. Father, that we would have boldness to speak forth your truth because our lives exhibit everything that, it, that we're saying. Not because we're perfect, Father, but because we're forgiven. <clears throat> Not because we, by any means of our own, have attained anything, but because you have given us grace and mercy. I ask, Lord God, that you would strengthen us for the work that you've set before us. Fathers, ambassadors of the message of reconciliation, we would be faithful in proclaiming your message. Soften our hearts towards you, Father. Soften our hearts towards each other. Soften our hearts toward the world around us that we would be encouraged and motivated to speak forth your truth to them. Bless you today, Father. We honor you. We thank you for your presence in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.